Welcome back to SALT Talks, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us again today. We've had great response to the first few SALT Talks, and we're really excited about the lineup that we have coming over the next month, and we're really excited about the guests we have today as well as tomorrow. Uh, SALT, as many of you know, is a thought leadership platform and, and networking forum. Uh, we have an annual conference that we do every year in Las Vegas, as well as international conferences that we've had in Abu Dhabi, Singapore, and Tokyo. And we look forward to resuming those conferences in person, hopefully in 2021. But in the meantime, uh, we're having a lot of fun doing these SALT Talks. Um, SALT Talks are a series of digital interviews with leading thinkers and innovators across finance, technology, and geopolitics. And today, we're very excited to have a senior member of the Obama administration joining us, uh, Valerie Jarrett. Uh, Valerie is a distinguished senior fellow at the University of Chicago Law School. She previously served as a senior advisor to President Obama and the assistant to the president for public engagement and intergovernmental affairs during his entire tenure from 2009 to 2017. Uh, the office that she occupied was actually the position that Anthony uh, was going to occupy in the White House prior to some shenanigans which he and Valerie can get into during the talk. Uh, she also managed the Office of Urban Affairs and served as the co-chair of the Obama-Biden Transition Project. She's the author of a fantastic book uh, that came out in April of 2019 called Finding My Voice, and I got to get the new tagline right here, Finding My Voice, uh, When the Plan Crumbles, the Real Adventure Begins. Um, and you can order the book online at ValerieJarrettBook.com, and we highly recommend you do that, especially in this moment. There's so many relevant uh, topics that she covers in that book. Uh, Valerie will be interviewed today by Anthony Scaramucci, the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, as well as the chairman of SALT. And if you have any questions during the talk, just post them to the Q&A section uh, at the bottom of your screen uh, on the Zoom link, and we will get to those uh, during the course of the interview. And I'll throw it over to Anthony and Valerie. Oh, well, first of all, uh, John, thank you. Uh, Valerie, uh, uh, great to have you with us. Uh, I want to personally uh, give a shout out and thank uh, Robert Wolf for introducing us a few years ago. I had the great honor of visiting you in the White House when you were working with the Obama administration, and then you you came to SALT uh, a couple of years back while you were a White House official, which really uh, was an amazing part of our story, and I appreciate you being a friend of SALT and so forth. So, But I, I want to start out with the book, because I think you have a, a fascinating life story uh, in terms of uh, where you were born, where you were raised how you developed your relationship with uh, the president and first lady. Uh, and unlike me, who only lasted 11 days, you lasted the entire administration. And so and we both know that Washington is a rough town. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Let's start at the way beginning, if you don't mind. Tell us a little bit about yourself for people that don't know you, Val. Sure. Well, uh, as you mentioned, I was born in Shiraz, Iran. Uh, during the mid-50s, at a time when the United States and Iran had very strong diplomatic ties. My parents, uh, my dad was born in Washington, my mom, Chicago, and they ended up in Iran because when my father finished uh, his service in the military, uh, he was a physician. He could not find a job comparable to his white counterparts at major academic institutions uh, around this country, and that's what he wanted to do was research. And so they explored other alternatives and landed this job starting a new hospital and chairing the Department of Pathology uh, in Iran, the Namazi Hospital. I was the second baby, Anthony, born in that hospital. They practiced on some other poor baby first. And then we lived there for, until I was five. From there, we moved to London. And from London, my father uh, landed a job at the University of Chicago Medical Center in the neighborhood where my grandmother and extended family all lived. And growing up, one of the important lessons he taught me is that sometimes the shortest distance to where you really want to go means you have to be prepared to take the long way around. And so his long way around took him halfway around the world. And it, it, it really was an important sense of being flexible, being willing to look at, you know, look at perspectives outside the envelope to see where your real possibilities might lie. Uh, and so I was fortunate to have Barbara and Jimmy Bowman as my parents and a huge extended family since I'm an only child, gave me great love, unconditional love, more support than I could ever ask for, and set really high expectations of not who I would, what I would do, but who I would be, and uh, the sense that to those who much is given, 
much as expected and instilled in me this really strong work ethic, which has served me well. And so, so you, you meet Michelle Obama first, right? Is he, Michelle she's your Robinson. first. Michelle, even Robinson. Oh, Michelle, I'm sorry, excuse me. Yeah, no. Michelle Robinson, I'm sorry. Yeah, I should, that's uh, uh, the first lady's maiden name. So tell us a little bit about that. So that, yeah, that's your... Uh, yeah, it'll be 30 years next summer. So in the summer of 1991, um, I was Mayor Daly's deputy chief of staff. I practiced law for 10 years, six years in the private sector, four for the Corporation Council for the city. He just promoted me to deputy chief of staff, and I was trying to recruit people to come and join the office. And a uh, friend of mine who was the number two person in the law department sent me her resume, Susan Scher wrote across the top, brilliant young lawyer, please interview her, I think you'll be impressed. She doesn't want to practice law at a big law firm anymore, and that was music to my ears, because I had hated the practice of law at a big law firm. And uh, I still remember her walking in my office, Anthony, shook my hand, had her hair pulled back like I do, only mine is because I can't have been able to get a haircut, uh, and commanding presence for a, you know, she was in her mid-20s, 27 year old kid, basically. And what I remember most is she told me her story. And we all now know it as a quintessential American story. Growing up on the South Side, working class family, parents who didn't go to college, but instilled in her and her brother this, this uh, similar value to my parents that you gotta get out there and work hard and do something purposeful with your life. And her dad and her best friend, she shared with me, had died within the last year. Suddenly, both of them. Her father had been sick for a long time, but they weren't expecting his death. And her friend, who had been a roommate, uh, I, I remember. I remember that from her book. Yeah, she wrote a yeah. also a great book. And she said it was just a wake up call to: Am I leading that purposeful life that I was raised to lead? And and could I explore public service as a way of giving back to a city that I love? And so we clicked. I offered her a job on the spot. She wisely said, "Let me think about it." Talked it over with her fiance. He thought it was a bad idea. And so when I called to say, what do you think? She said, well, I got this problem. And I'm like, well, who's your fiance? Why do we care what he thinks? What do you want to do? And so she laughed and she said, you got to meet this guy. Would you have dinner with us? And let's talk it through. And that's what we did. And the rest, if you might say, is history. And so now your, you know, your relationship is continuous. It goes on. Uh, uh, then uh, young Senator Obama, he wins the the senator, uh, he becomes a senator in 2006. Uh, he wants to run for president. Talk a little bit about that, because I think it's also an interesting part of the conversation about his decision to run for president and your advice to him. Well, I learned my lesson when he was considering running for the Senate. I thought it was not prudent. He just lost the congressional race. And I thought, well, if you can't win our district, we live a block apart in Chicago. And we know the neighborhood well, and I was like, well, if you can't win here, how are you going to win statewide? Um, Illinois is, in a sense, a microcosm of the country. You have Chicago as a big city, but you've got farmland and rural communities. And he said, well, I've been going down state since I was first elected, and whenever I go down, I get headlines because usually state senators from Chicago don't venture into farm country. And I understand their issues, and I care about them, and I think they know that. And Mrs. Obama said, let's have a brunch at your home and talk him out of this. Cause she also had a, had about enough of politics. And by the end of the brunch, he'd convinced us not only should he do it, but I should chair his finance committee for his Senate race. When we said, well, how are you going to raise any money? He's like, you are. So when he decided to run for president, I think, well, I actually think after the convention speech in 2004, I yep. saw his ability to connect broadly around the country with this message of no old red States and blue States, just the United States. And I thought he had what it took. Now, my parents didn't. My parents thought he'd lost his mind. Uh, and again, remember, they grew up during Jim Crow, experienced racism and discrimination firsthand, did not think in their lifetime that there would ever be a black man elected president. In fact, my father, who grew up in D.C., had never set foot in the White House, even on a tour, until I worked there. Uh, so this was really kind of the difference in generations, whereas my daughter was like, well, of course he could win. Why wouldn't he win? So it just shows you in three generations what a difference it was. But I felt like they had raised me to believe if you worked hard and you had a goal and anything is possible. And after he was elected, my mom said, how did you even know he could win? Not that he would, but 
Anthony, even that he could win. And I reminded her of how she'd raised me. You know what she said? Well, I never really believed that. And I realized, <laughs> oh my gosh, they raised me aspirationally. Not as the reality that they knew, but free to develop my own. And so... Well, I, I had that identity. I can totally identify with that. I, my, my parents did that with us. You know, my dad was a blue collar worker. You and I've talked about that. And you had to sit at his dinner table at 515 in the afternoon and you had to do your homework and you were going places. You know, and he used to drive us into the wealthy areas of the town. He said, ah, you're going to live in one of those houses someday. And yeah. we, we actually we actually believed it. So, yeah, whether well, he thing. believed it or not, you believed it. <laughs> exactly. You know, I, I bought into the whole thing. And but, you know, that was one of the you know things that. You know, and we've talked about this because something has gone wrong because my father was in an aspirational blue collar family. I'm sure your parents, your dad was more educated, but they had these aspirations for their children. Uh, when I was campaigning for President Trump and going into certain areas, and I'm sure you experienced this during President Obama's campaign, you felt a sense of desperation that the economic aspirations of a blue collar family were becoming economically desperational. And so it's a good juxtaposition to where we are right now because we have the race component overlaid on it. And I'm interested to get your reaction to this. This is my opinion. I want to, I want to get your reaction to this. Is it a, it's always been there, Valerie, it's always been systemic in our society, but there's been a very large group of people, white people, uh, that have either not necessarily ignored it, but have not taken it to full credence. It now seems that we're at a boiling point, soci boiling point societally where people are like, okay, we have to get a hold of this thing. We have to figure it out. You were addressing some of this this morning on Morning Joe, and I was just wondering if you could take us there, what your thoughts are related to it. Sure. So I think you're right, Anthony. Our country has a deep and painful history of racism and discrimination going back to slavery. We've already talked about my parents growing up in the Jim Crow era where they couldn't go to certain restaurants, couldn't go to the movies, couldn't stay at certain hotels, had to worry about lynching, particularly in the South, obviously. Um, went through the civil rights movement, saw great strides in terms of protections that were put in place in the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. and and you began to feel that perhaps we were making some progress. And we have. I mean, my goodness, I don't think we should, should say that we haven't made a great deal of progress. Uh, and I, But I do believe that part of, as you described it, boiling over, I, I am hoping it's more of an inflection point and, and now a turning point, is that all of the cumulative effect of that has had a painful, frustrating, exhausting impact in the black community. And I think for the rest of our country, those who do not feel that they are discriminatory or racist have been free to ignore what as a black person, you can't ignore every black family I know, and I'm not being hyperbolic, every black family I know, regardless of their income or station in life, gives their black sons a lecture over and over and over again about how to comport themselves with the police. And the police are a microcosm of a societal problem. Uh, the difference is that they take an oath of office and are given a badge and a gun. And it's also a microcosm of the challenge we have within our overall criminal justice system, which President Obama described after the death of Trayvon Martin. He said, if I had a son, he'd look like me, and we have to do some soul searching to figure out why that is so scary to people, why every black boy and black girl can't have the same trajectory as everyone else. And so I think we have been on this continuum, certainly during President Obama's time in office, we had Michael Brown, we had uh, Eric Garner, Tamira Rice, Laquan McDonald in my own hometown. And so it has been building for a long time. And then you bring to this current climate, and I do believe that the president President Trump has, as opposed to brought us together and de-escalated tensions, has actually polarized us. And then you overlay on top of that social media and everybody getting information on demand. It makes it easy to retreat to your comfort zone and not have to talk to people who you might disagree with and try to find some common ground. And then you add a global pandemic, which has had such a disproportionate impact on communities of color, particularly the black community. Health disparities have been laid bare, income disparities 
fragility in terms of benefits at work, whether people have insurance or paid sick days or paid leave. And then we all watch on television a man die in slow motion. And it, his death, and I should pause to say his service today is in Minnesota and you know, his family, my heart goes out to him. But then his six-year-old daughter yesterday said, my daddy changed the world and I sure hope she's right. Because the nonchalantness with which those officers killed him is what's stunning. And they saw the cameras. They knew they were being videotaped. So where are we where police who were sworn to serve and protect can behave in that way in this great country in 2020? And I think all of that coming together is what has caused demonstrations, the vast majority Anthony peaceful in all 50 states and in fact around the world. Because people look to us as that beacon of hope. And at the same time, you have President Trump sending in law enforcement to physically remove peaceful demonstrators using tear gas and rubber bullets. Why? Why? So that he can walk and stand in front of a church that he had not been inside of since Inauguration Day and hold Mm -hmm. up a, a Bible and try to use the church and a Bible as a prop, which has received received not only criticism from the church, but also now for the first time in my lifetime that I can remember from the military leaders who always hold themselves above politics. So all of that has kind of come to a head. And the question is, where do we go from here? So yeah, I, 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 wanna, I wanna ask you this question. It's a, it's a little bit of a pointed question, but I, I'm curious to get your reaction to it. There is, uh, uh, a commentator on CNN uh, by the name of Van Jones. We both know him personally. Uh, the evening of President Trump's election, he said it was a white lash. I don't know if you heard him say that. I remember it very well. And, and I didn't get it at the time. I have to totally confess that. Obviously, I was uh, you know, pro-Trump at that time. I was trying to help the president. I saw that blue-collar despair in those white communities, frankly, a, you know, a community I grew up in. I mean, we had blacks and whites in, in, in our community, but it was a blue collar community. And I'm just wondering, is that over? Meaning, are we at a that inflection point that you're describing, uh, assuming that Van Jones was correct in 2016, you can tell me if he was or he wasn't, but assuming that he was, are we getting over are we are we at an inflection point now where we can move the society to a post-racial society, meaning where your skin color, my skin color is going to be irrelevant. Are are we there or are the stereotypes so hardened in the society that we're not there? And then if we're not there, what is it going to take to get there? Well, let me say a few things on that. Um, First of all, I think that what we saw with the economic crisis in 2008 coupled with the advances that technology have brought to efficiency and needing fewer people in the workforce to do the same jobs, do different jobs with higher requirements of training, that you're right, for the first time, many white Americans wondered, would their children have a better opportunity than they had had? And that was a first for them. And in a sense, they were experiencing what the black community has worried about all along. And, and now that it was a crisis with them, The question is, well, whose fault is it and what do you do about it? But in terms of the the backlash, I think we should also remember that our elections in our country have always been close. Uh, President Trump lost by three million in the popular vote. Uh, He lost in three states by fewer than 100,000 votes. So it was a very close election. And 100 million eligible voters did not vote. And that is really where I have been focusing my energies is what can we do to get people who have looked at Washington or even their local elections and decided, you know, this isn't relevant to my life, or they're all bums, I don't like any of them, or I'm just, what does one vote count? And I hope that over the last three and a half years, we've had a real civics lesson. The elections at all levels really do have consequences. It's one of the reasons why Michelle Obama and I started an organization called When We All Vote. Michelle is the founding member of it. We've uh, been able to bring in lots of co-chairs. It's nonpartisan. And she wanted to do a nonpartisan initiative about voting. It's called When We All Vote because we think our country is stronger when all Americans vote. 
And we've been working really hard over the last couple of years since it was launched in 2018 to focus on not just who's the president of the United States, albeit important, it matters who's in your local, who's in your, who's your mayor, who's on the city council electing or appointing police chiefs, who are the prosecutors making decisions about who to bring cases about, who are the judges sitting in judgment and affecting our lives, who are in the state legislatures drawing districting lines and appropriating funds and certainly who's the check and balance in Congress. And that if we can raise the awareness and make people see the nexus between their lives and voting, then we'll have a stronger democracy regardless of which party actually wins and better accountability, I think. Because I, what I've observed, and I'm curious, Anthony, about what you think about this, is that President Trump seems to be really focusing his energies and his message on a relatively small part of our country, assuming if he can get them very excited that that energy will result in turnout and that if everybody else is apathetic, then he wins without actually getting the majority of the American people to be supportive. There's no question. Well, there's no question about that. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll add evidence to that. The last time I talked to the president was uh, Easter Sunday of 2019. He was sore at me because I had written an op-ed uh, that the press is not the enemy of the people. You could find it on hill.com, just expressing, you know, the understanding of the Constitution, the institution of it, and the need for the press not only to hold people in power accountable, but the press does something else for our society, which you and I have talked about. If we can teach our second grade children to speak and think freely, they go on and become great economic innovators. They invent Facebook and, and Google and all these other great uh, companies. If you, if you don't teach them to speak freely, like in China, well, then what happens is you're narrowing the band of their creativity. And so he got very sore at me. I said to him, well, what about the, uh, the independents and the moderates? And he said something that was very telling. He says, no, no, I'm worried about the base. Let me work on the base. Everything else will take care of itself. And to your point is he's making the bet that the vote will be down and the base vote will be up. And it's also something that concerns him because uh, he said it repeatedly and General Kelly and I who were we're going to be with General Kelly tomorrow on Assault Talk. General Kelly and I have talked about this. The president really believes, rightly or wrongly, uh, that if that base turns out in a magnificent sort of way, to use one of his words, uh, he'll, win the, he'll win the president, well, and, 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 irrespective of the popular vote or all that other stuff. So everything he's doing on Twitter, that walk across Lafayette Park, that is designed for the base. That photo op. I mean, holding the Bible, I mean, you know, my wife said something funny. I probably shouldn't say it, but we're on live. But she's like, it was almost like a soiled diaper the way he was holding it. I mean, he, he, he wasn't holding the Bible with somebody at any level of general familiarity with the Bible. So, I mean, look, it, it is what it is. We're here now. Uh, uh, but I, I guess my question, though, is Robert Kennedy got it right. He said in 1968 that there would be an African-American man as president, that he saw that inside of 40 years, there was a possibility that an African-American man would be president. And Barack Obama was sworn in 40 years to the day from that statement. I guess what I'm asking is, can we move the society again? Uh, can we move it where we can become from a policy and a stereotyping point of view post-racial? Uh, and, I'll, and I'll say one thing to you that I think you know, you'll get. My first year Harvard Law School, two African-American kids were picked up walking to the convenience store. They were in my class. 30 years later, Professor Gates is with you and President Obama, you know, having a beer with the cops that did that 30 years later. So it clearly didn't happen in my adult lifetime, but can it happen in my children's lifetime? Yes. Now, post-racial is a big word. Uh, will we be able to eradicate all racism in our country in our lifetime? No, of course not. No, no, of course not. No, of no, course not. But can we make, can we develop this sense of empathy for one another? And, and in a sense, that's what this crisis point shows when you have uh, crowds all over the country that are not just black people marching, but they're white people and Latino people and Native American people, young people, old people, people of all walks of life around our country have um, resoundingly expressed, not just in their physical presence on the street, where let's face it, in the middle of a pandemic, they're taking a chance with their, right, with their life. And so they feel so strongly that they're, they're willing to 
go out there, notwithstanding the fact that our experts tell us it's not safe. Um, but we also, I think, when you add to, to that, which gives me some hope, is, is that we're seeing action on the ground. And, and, and so there are two issues here. One is racism. And that's within our own hearts. And we've got to work that through. And I think some of it is generational and it's young people talking to their parents and talking to their grandparents. I had this conversation with my mother this morning. She said she was very influenced by my daughter uh, and, that, and that we shouldn't think that older people can't change and can't learn and can't grow. Um, so I think that that is happening. But the other thing that is so important, and this is a piece of what President Obama was talking about at his town hall yesterday, is, is that we have a right to expect that government's role is to ensure that there is justice and that it is using whatever levers it has at its disposal to try to make sure that even if people don't feel a certain way, that they behave a certain way. And so I can't tell you what's in your heart, but I can, I can insist that you treat me with respect. And when we, when we talk just about the police, for example, Yesterday, uh, President Obama asked mayors to make a pledge that they'll work with their communities within the next 60 to 90 days at the use of force. This is a hot button item for many people of color. And it, it was one of the recommendations in the task force report that he presented when he was in office and gave to all of local law enforcement, because we have something like 18,000 local law enforcement agencies in the country, and they're the ones that make the decisions about how the law is meted out. Well, I called a group of mayors yesterday whose text I, numbers I had just to see if before President Obama's remarks, we could get some to commit. So I called the mayors of San Francisco, LA, Minneapolis, Chicago, DC, Atlanta, New York. All of them literally just like that said, of course we'll do that. A few of them were already going through that exercise. Mayor of San Francisco, and Reed is right in the midst of implementing the task force report. So I say this to say you expect the government to ensure that if we are about law and order, as President uh, Trump said yesterday, that it has to be fairly meted out, that it has, there has to be equal justice, that it has to be, there has to be transparency and accountability. And so if the police departments around the country can start to take those necessary steps, then at least we can control the behavior. And I would also add that the, this Justice Department has been missing in action. When Michael Brown was murdered in Ferguson, uh, and we had demonstrations as a result of that. President Obama sent Eric Holder to Ferguson to meet with the police department, with the advocates, with the family of Michael Brown, with the faith community, and say, what is going on here? And it triggered a, a pattern and practice investigation, which the Justice Department can do, which is an enormous stick to hold over local law enforcement agencies. It's the best stick that they have. And guess what they found in Ferguson? pattern of practice. And so then they can get a judge involved and enter into a consent decree. And so I've, all of this is to say, our government, even if our culture isn't there yet, we need to have a justice system that, pro, that protects against the discrimination that comes from racism. And I think that this, with this younger generation, just as we've seen with LGBTQ rights, where we've seen a revolution in thought over, uh, less than 10 years. I think that this has really been a wake up call. You saw yesterday businesses announcing, we've got to look at our diversity and inclusion policies. We've got to see what is our role in being complicit in this. It's not enough to just be quiet. People have to speak up and they have to change their behavior. And I think by doing that, it will also change hearts. Well, I, I, I certainly hope so. And I do, I do appreciate the, uh, the sentiment. Before we turn it over to outside questions, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the campaign, November uh, 2020. Uh, what, what do you see President Obama's role, First Lady Obama, yourself? Uh, do you, uh, if you had to gauge the activity of the President and First Lady, uh, where, do you, where do you see it? Well, look, I think as President Obama said when he endorsed Vice President Biden a few weeks ago, he's all in. He's going to do everything within his power, as am I, to help uh, uh, Vice President Biden. And look, nobody knows Vice President Biden in terms of his qualifications for this than President Obama because he worked with him each and every day for eight years, as did I. So I think we both think he has the track record, experience, 
empathy. This is a man who, you know, grew up in a working class family whose father had to move to get a job. They were in tough economic strait and he's had more personal loss than any one human being should have to have. And, and rather than it making him bitter uh, and pulling back, it actually has made him incredibly empathetic. Just one little story about um, Joe is when my dad died, we were in the administration and uh, his assistant called up and said, Vice President Biden's on his way to your office. And I said, my office? You know, I think my office is on the second floor. I'm like, I'll come down. She says, no, no, he's coming to you. And he came in, he closed the door, he sat me down and he said, Valerie, I promise you that when you think of your dad, that the tears that you have today will turn to smiles. Just give it to time. And we had, I, mean, I cried, he cried. We talked about his losses and mine. That empathy, and, and he turned out he was right. I now smile. I'm, I'm not bursting into tears every time I think about my dad. And the empathy that I know he has and that he's able to convey with complete authenticity mm -hmm. because he's been there, yeah. I think our country hungers for that right yeah. now. So the, the question will be, in this environment where it's, you can't go and campaign, you can't knock on doors, you can't do the conventional things, we don't even know if we'll have conventions um, coming up this summer, what do you do? And I think we have to get creative and we'll be using the internet and all kinds of sure. ways. Um, so I think we're all in, we're gonna do everything we can. I think he has a great message, I think it's terrific. He's gonna have a woman as a running mate that sends an enormous signal to half our population, how important he thinks it is to break that barrier. Um, but it will, as I said earlier, it's gonna rest on turnout. It's gonna rest on people, and part of why we're pushing early vote where there's no evidence whatsoever of vote fraud, part of why we're pushing early, um, not just early vote, but also vote by mail. Again, no evidence of vote fraud. And also vote by mail, no evidence that it leans in favor of either political party, uh, is to make it easier for people to vote when they shouldn't have to choose between their health and exercise. Oh, well, I mean, look, it's, it's very obvious to me. The president is saying all that stuff because he wants to suppress the vote. He, he, he's figured out exactly what you know, suppress the vote, turn out his base. Uh, that, that, that's his pathway to reelection. So, but, but with that, uh, uh, I'm going to turn it over to John Dorsey. He's got some questions from, Great. from our audience. So one of our, one of our uh, audience members texted me, said, well, it was, it was tear, it was, it was not tear gas, it was smoke canisters. And so you see, this is what's going on in our society now. You know, it really doesn't matter whether it was tear gas or smoke canisters. Well, you know what? You're clearing, you're, you're clearing innocent people from Lafayette Park exactly. so that a guy can stand with a Bible in front of a church where the bishop inside the church actually doesn't want him there. And you're, you're disrupting what General Mattis said, the classic, most important right in our society to freely express our values and who we were. And, and you have foreign film, Australian film, British film, uh, European film, where that park was very peaceful at 6.30 p.m. So anyway, that's where we are now, though. We're going to debate tear gas versus smoke canisters because well, we got certain let me let me just push back to say and by the way when i when i get off when i get off this thing i'm calling him to yell at him okay because he's a well, young guy who i genuinely like okay well let's turn it over to uh john doris well, as we're turning it over let's just say and i heard this yesterday if you look up the definition of tear gas it includes smoke canisters and when you saw people out there whose eyes were burning and who were throwing up in the streets and who had been exercising as general Mattis said that constitutional right the question is is that what we should be doing is that what we should be expecting from our oh, we, we had we had it we had to allay the president's insecurities about being stuck in that bunker and so that that was the that was the big deal so all right let's turn it over to john dorsey hey john yeah when we talk about systemic racism police brutality is only one piece of the puzzle and there's been a lot of talk about economically how we empower young African Americans and people of color in the United States. What type of New Deal economically do you envision for Black America? You know, Robert Johnson, the founder of BET, recently came out calling for 14 trillion in reparations. What do we need to do from an education perspective, from an economic perspective, to just close the opportunity gap, the opportunity inequality that exists in America? Well, sure, well, it starts with a equal education for every young child. Part of what President Obama is focusing on with his initiative, My Brother's Keeper, is what can we do to keep our young boys and men of color outside of the justice system to begin with? 
and that is to put their life on a better economic trajectory, which we all know begins with education uh, and affordable education. We all know that so many young people um, don't go to college because they can't afford the loans and they know they'll never be able to repay them. And so how do we bring down the cost and increase the access to education? And then we have to work on the employment side. And look, there's so much that every business leader who's tuning in today can do to go out and recruit. And the, the good news here is that you're not doing it because it's a nice thing to do. You're doing it because the evidence now shows that diversity is a strength. It gives us a competitive advantage in a global marketplace. Uh, and that goes to people of color and it goes to women. And the, also the good news is that the majority of CEOs now understand that. But the question is, does it trickle down within the culture of the organization? And so you have to put in place both structural uh, and cultural changes that make it easier for people to enter the workforce, have that upward mobility, and stay there once they're hired. And that's when policies around inclusion become so important. Now, I always say to people, if you want to recruit black people, who are you sending out and where are you sending them? Do you recruit at HBCUs? And when they come in, do they see anyone who looks like them? And I think there's a greater level of sensitivity to the importance of implicit bias training, for example. I'm on the board of Lyft. There isn't anyone at Lyft who hires who hasn't first had to go through implicit bias training to try to level that playing field because we all have implicit biases. So I think that the beginning is the, is the education and then it is increasing opportunity in the workplace. And it's making sure that people who are hired feel welcome. And that can be everything from the affinity groups that I know a lot of companies have to ensuring that they are uh, they have mentors that help them move up the move up the corporate ladder. Uh, and and also helping businesses get started. Access to capital is a huge barrier. What are we doing to ensure that black owned businesses have that access to capital so that they can grow their own net worth um, without having to depend on on others. So there's so much that we could do. Uh, and the good news is that I think businesses are beginning to wake up and realize that. Thanks a lot, Valerie. We have another question um, about process and organizational management. So the Trump administration has become notorious for sort of a revolving door of personnel and a lack of you know, organizational management and structure within the White House. Uh, what is what did an average day in the Obama administration White House look like from a process perspective and what you can tell from the Trump administration? How uh, did those two processes differ? We were big on process. Process was important. We wanted to make sure that uh, recommendations that went to the president were soup, as we call them, uh, that we didn't take half baked to mix my metaphor ideas to him. Uh, and so we put a structure in process in place. But before that, and I co-chaired his transition team, we spent a lot of time on recruitment. Uh, we spent a lot of time vetting folks, which is painful, as Anthony can tell you. It's a horrible process that you have to go through. You just have to you know, lift up your skirt and tell everybody everything. But that's so important on the front end, not just in terms of making sure that folks who needed to get confirmed would be able to get confirmed, but are the people that you're hiring share your values, your perspective, your determination to move the country forward and then you have to work to build a team. Uh, but let's go back to the process for a minute. So the average day for us consisted with a senior staff meeting with the chief of staff, a small one with the most senior advisors, then a larger one where our direct reports would come in. We focused both on the challenges of the day, but we always made time for what are the longer term, term projects that we're working on so that we could keep those in the back of our mind and prioritize. We'd meet with the president. We'd go over the recommendations that were coming from the staff. Our staff secretary had a hugely important job. It doesn't sound very sexy, but that person was responsible for making sure that the paper that went to the president had been fully analyzed by the necessary parties, whether it was the policy councils, the domestic policy, economic policy, national security policy, whether it was the cabinet um, agencies had weighed in so the bother, and then it came to the senior staff for us to weigh in. We would spend enormous effort on the paper. President Obama spent hours, hours every night after dinner reading memos that we had sent him, uh, decision memos or discussion memos, because the most important, the most important precious uh, quality that the president has is his time. And we wanted to make sure that we were efficient with his time 
that it wasn't just the last person who walked in the room that was changing everything. And we stuck to that process. And I can say every chief of staff he had was really good at trying to make sure the process was tight. And we worked on our culture. And I'll tell you, early on, some of the women were having a tough time. And I describe in my book, uh, President Obama, who said, wait a minute, your voices are important. You're here because you're subject matter expertise, but also because you're going to present a different perspective. And how we had to work on that culture, which takes time and energy and determination and intentionalism. And that applies to any, any operation, any business, private or public. And by the end of the first term, he told a reporter, you know, in the beginning, I had the best team on the field. And by the end of the first term, the best players on the field. I blew the, I blew the punchline. By the end of the first term, I had the best team. And I think that's also a message. Like, how do you, how do you um, work with people so that they trust one another? So that if you have a crisis, like our one of our biggest self-inflicted debacles was when our website for healthcare.gov crashed. And we had spent months trying to get it right. And the president had been so clear, like, is it going to work? Is it going to work? Yes, sir, it's going to work. And then it didn't work. And we didn't spend one minute blaming one another for it. Nor did he, I might add. It was like, get to work and get it fixed. And you can't do that unless you are sure that you are a team and that you have each other's backs. And so I'm not in the current White House, but I will say having a revolving door, having so much leaking to the press, having a message change so many times in the course of um, the minute, let alone the day and the hour, and not having the discipline of ensuring that whatever the president says is accurate and evidence-based. And I remember one of our press secretaries once said, when I was in to a briefing before he went out to the briefing room back when there were briefings, um, if you're not sure, I can't say it. He said, if I go out there and I say something that is not true, that will reflect on President Obama. That doesn't mean we always got it right, but it shows the intentionality of the effort. Thank you, Valerie. One more question, and this relates to the 2020 election. You talked about the importance of voter, voter turnout and how you and a lot of Obama administration alumni have been focused on the voter turnout piece. But if you're Vice President Biden or, or his campaign manager, and you're trying to zero in on one, two, or three core themes to hit on that are going to resonate with swing voters in swing states, there's obviously a lot of things that you could nitpick about or not nitpick, that you could criticize President Trump about in terms of character flaws and dividing the society. What are the core themes that, that you think he should really focus on, Vice President Biden, in, in order to really pull those swing voters to his side? Well, I think the economy, look, it's front and center. Millions and millions of Americans have lost their jobs. We have a, a higher unemployment than any time before the Great Depression. So uh, for those who've lost their jobs and who don't know whether by the election they'll have their jobs back, those whose jobs were changing anyway as a result of technology. What are we gonna to do to rebuild the economy, not just to back to where it was, with a very low unemployment rate, but with a lot of people underemployed? What are we gonna to do to make sure that we are building an economy that works for everybody? That people aren't slipping through the cracks? What are we gonna do about our healthcare system to make sure that we move in, on the building blocks of the Affordable Care Act, as I said earlier, the COVID-19 has laid bare the health disparities that exist. I think that people who are in swing states want to know that we are going to also re-enter the global dialogue as the leader of the free world again, and not necessarily just go it alone our own way, because the big challenges that we have as a, as a, uh, as a world really have to be solved through cooperation. Uh, the Paris Climate Accord that President Obama so successfully was able to get nearly 200 countries to sign, required that effort because the United States can't combat climate change alone. Uh, the deal that we had to keep Iran from developing nuclear weapons required Russia, China, Great Britain, France, Germany, the European Union, all working together to put pressure on Iran. Big challenges require pandemics. The reason why Ebola never reached our shores was because President Obama got on the phone with other critical world leaders and said, we have to work to contain it so that it doesn't bleed out and enter into our countries. The goodwill that you need in order to do that uh, is something else I think Vice President Biden brings to the table. So the economy, healthcare, making sure people are treated equally, uh, being a world leader again, participating and, and working with our allies, not chastising them and, and, um, and 
aligning ourselves with those who, um, who don't reflect our values, all of that's important. And then the final point, which is really the vice president's message is he wants to really bring back the soul, restore the soul of our country. And I think that's the empathy. That's the sense that we are better when we are together. The e puris, puribus lunum of our message. I think that that is, uh, is important as well. I think that will resonate not just with swing voters, but with many good Republicans and Democrats uh, too. Well, Valerie, thanks so much for joining us today on short notice. You were our first call uh, when all the social unrest and the situation with George Floyd happened to to get your perspective on what's going on in the country and the path forward. I want to give another plug for your book. If you haven't read it, you go to ValerieJarrettBook.com. Uh, Valerie, I think, has one. Uh, well, let's get it up on. on let's get it up on the camera here. We, uh, yeah, let's, Valerie, hold it up. Let's take a look. That's the paperback. Look, you look, and I'm let's pushing face the paper. it, you look. Pardon me? Oh, I was saying I was pushing the paperback because I added two new chapters at the end, one of them presciently about my grandson at the very end in the world. I hope that he has, he's black and brown. And I talked about his parents having to give him that talk. And this was long before the current uh, crisis. And so in a sense, I, I hope people will read it with the thought of my grandson in mind and what can we do to make sure that his life and the lives of so many other people of color are better than they are today. Well, I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to it. I, I, I read the, I read the one last year that you gave me and thank you for that. And I, I'll, I'll read those concurrent chapters, but go ahead, John, we're, everyone's focused on the duck behind you, but go ahead, John, do your best here to finish up. <laughs> All right. Oh well, yeah. We want to thank Valerie again for joining us. Uh, you know, her and Anthony have, have struck up a great friendship. And when Anthony was set to serve in that OPL position in the Trump administration, Valerie was extremely gracious and, and kind in helping him make that transition. Uh, so, you know, just, it's been great to, to watch that friendship she, blossom she, across she the She told aisle. me not to do it. I didn't listen to her, Valerie. So from now to on, I'm going to listen. Before I make big decisions like that, I'm going to call you, okay? You'll tell me what to do. Please do. Please do. Thank you all. It's a pleasure. All right, guys. Thank you. you.